appreciate y'all chilling and politicking and paying attention because it's real vital. You heard me, Trench Talk TV. So that's what it's going to sound like. It ain't going to sound like nothing sugar cold. It ain't going to sound like what you want to hear. It's going to be Trench Talk. All right, all right. I want to welcome y'all to another episode of Trench Talk TV where we aim to educate, explore, and exhibit perspectives from the trenches all over. And uh, here today, man, we got a well-known recording artist, Big Head the Dome Doctor. It's your boy, Big Head the Dome Doctor. I'm in the building. You already know what it is. Trench Talk TV. I'm straight out the trenches. So lock it in, because it's going to get real trenchy. You heard me? I mean that, man. Uh, man, you got an interesting story, man. Um, where you from? I'm from Southside Baton Rouge. But from? I'm, I'm born in Detroit, Michigan. Born. But I came to Southside Baton Rouge when I was nine years old on the Greyhound bus from the Greyhound station in Detroit, Michigan to the Greyhound station in Southside Baton Rouge, Louisiana. So it's like I, I came from and I landed where I landed, I stuck. From a slum to a slum. Right, right. It, if, if you could remember, you say you moved over here, uh, you came this way when you was nine years old. If you could remember, how, how was life in Detroit? Well, life in Detroit, at first it was like green grass in the summer and white snow in the winter. Like that's that's what I remember at first, right. and then it turned into the struggle. When the struggle hit, it was more like when crack hit, cause crack hit in Detroit earlier than it hit in Baton Rouge. Right. See, crack didn't hit all the cities at the same time. It had to squeak through. So in Detroit, just think up north, it was already up there. So boom, there it went. And when crack hit. The, it turned to one color, and that was the struggle. It wasn't no more green grass, no more white winters. Like, the struggle, just one solid color, and that's dark. So, we went from Detroit to Louisiana, and it was different because, like I said, Detroit was, the, the Young Boys Incorporated had just started, and I had older brothers, and it was like the drug dealers, they didn't care. If you was in poverty or if you were struggling, they make sure they took your children. So what they would do is they would get the moms first and see who they can string out. And then once the mom gets strung out, they'll take the children and make them sell it. So what my mom did so her sons wouldn't get took away was start letting them sell out our house. So like at five, six, seven, eight, like all those years I was raised with the police kicking my door in and taking my mama to jail and, to, and when my oldest brothers got teenagers, they started taking them and whoever was there, the drug dealers, all that. Like that happened five or six times before I even came to Baton Rouge, you know what I'm saying? How many siblings? Um, I got three more brothers and one sister. My oldest brother named Dewan, he in jail. My next brother named Brian, he just got out of jail. And my other brother named um, person and he like you know be in and out but he kind of chilling right now and my sister she won right over me her name Tiffany we got the same mom same daddy one sister feel what I'm saying so you something like the youngest yeah I am the youngest but right. like when we hit it's like when we hit Baton Rouge and we had to make our way through the trenches I made my own way through the trenches so the trenches knew me they didn't know my family was um was was his dad around in the time in this uh, time frame? Bro, dad, grandpa, uncles. I'm gonna say the brothers too, but I'm gonna just I got them. We can exempt them out of the situation because I never place. had no male figure in my life to show me anything. Not go bowling, not basketball, not nothing. It was just the trenches, real life. All right, so you a nine year old moving to Baton Rouge from a bigger city. How, how that transition was for you when you made it? Well, it was kind of like, that was bad because like when where we landed at was Southside Baton Rouge in the trenches and by my people knew that we were coming, 
they was expecting somebody. Like, they was thinking, okay, they from up north and they from Detroit and we got family coming and boom, 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 boom. We didn't even have clothes to put on our back. So we didn't have food, we didn't have clothes. Like I was hustling food on our ride from Detroit to Baton Rouge. I was hustling people and the stops because it took three days because we on the bus. So when we got here, like our people was disappointed. So just imagine how you feel when you land and everybody thinking they finna see somebody and then when they see us, they like, oh, uh, really? Smiles and turned into problems. Yeah, they like, oh shit, like what is this? And we instantly had to go live with this one and I had to go stay with this one and my sister had to go stay here and my mama went in my head and my brothers and them was trying to hang in there cause they was a little older and knew about the streets. So they had to go straight in the streets. One of them went back then one went straight to jail and the other one went back when the other one went to jail. So there it was again, just me. Me and then my sister and my mom. Like I had to run them down and get shelter for us to stay in together. Or other than that, it would have been, I'm in the streets the best way I can. My sister who was one years older than me in the streets the best way she could. And my mom who done got overtooken by the the drugs and the offers because she knew how to cook crack and they didn't even know what it was. So by her knowing how to cook it, that made a lot of people gravitate towards her. So the overwhelming, you know, offers of drugs just blinded her from her children like she didn't even have none. And she went to straight behind that. And it was like, big head, you own your own. Like I didn't go to school for a year. I didn't I didn't have no records or nothing for a whole year until people realized what as was going child. on as a child. Like when, when I first hit Baton Rouge, like it was like just just no man's land. And while other children going to school, only place I was going was the soup kitchen down the street for the Jews, because I knew it was down the street. You feel what I'm saying? Talk about all the mud and the time. Right. Definitely talking about the trenches. <laughs> was Man. it was it somewhere in this time frame? I believe you got uh you got influenced by LL Cool J to start rapping. Well, that was in Detroit. Oh, all right. So, so you rapping before you come to back. Right. So we can bag it up a little bit if you want to, because like I say, the courage. See, I got the courage from LL Cool J rap, because it was like I'm bad and you know stuff like that. And then he hit him with I need love and. I knew I needed that. I didn't know from where, but I knew I needed it. You know, like how he explained, he made me feel like everybody needed love at that point. And just think I was probably eight years old when it came out, but it was on the radio and I was by myself. I was lonely, like, and, and that was coming on. I wasn't thinking about a girl. I was just thinking about like shelter, heat, lights, food, clothes, you know, like that was love. When I was a little boy, that was love. That's how they show love by taking care of their children. Right. See, like now, I don't know what's going on, but that's what was love back then. So you found some kind of peace in the music. Sound like it was definitely. Your it, like I say, it was, it was definitely my therapy because it was my courage, and, and and that's what I needed more than anything was courage because like, the we ran from Detroit, we ran in Detroit. You know what I'm saying? And I was just following my mom's or my brother's lead. And we was running. I wasn't I wasn't built for running. I was like, I, I don't, I'm not cool with that. So once we got to Baton Rouge, I was like, I'm not running no more. Like I'ma face whatever come my way, I'ma face it, even if I gotta face it by myself. So Big Head the Dome Doctor was off the porch at 10 years old. Definitely. Big Head the Dome Doctor was certifying other niggas that was 13 and 14 and 15 when I was 10 years old. Because at nine, I got their attention. You know, like when I when I went to doing what I wanted to do, like I ain't had no rules or regulations. And you know, at 10, I probably was hanging in front of the animal house. And, I, and, I, and all the women in the animal house was, was lying, telling me, cause they knew my struggle. They was like, just tell the man when he come out, you my son. And he gonna give you a dollar 50 cent or something like that. So I was doing that at nine or 10. Were you having any run-ins with the police at this time? Well, run-ins with the police, Ben. What age did they start? Around that 10-year age? 
Nah, about, like I say, about six. Because I went from being small enough. When the police, when I start, first start seeing police and they first start kicking in our doors, I was small enough for them to hold me in their arms. But I still knew that I didn't want to be held by them, but I was small enough for them to hold me in their arms. I still would get up and strike out because it was scared the shit out of me. Just think you like six years old and the door come open, boom! And you land on the couch. You know, so I strike and by the time I make it to the back, one of the police have been a cop me, but I be so small, they be holding me in their arms. And that's how I remember growing up, like from that, like I might have a world, the world record of police kicking in doors because I grew up with the same hustle, with the same, you know, thing. So, you know, they kicked in the door five or six times of my own, you know what I'm saying? But it, it started at five, six years old. 